Hello again, and welcome to Anatomy and Physiology with Mr. Homley. We are on part three of our skeletal system notes, and in this section we'll be dealing with bone growth and development. Ossification, uh, that's the general term for the process of bone tissue formation, uh, and ossification will lead to the formation of the bony skeleton and embryos, so going from a cartilage to a bone skeleton. Uh, bone growth um, until early adulthood when you're done growing or adding new bone just to get height or width. Bone thickening, remodeling, and repair, which happens throughout your entire lifetime. Your skeleton is not static when you're done growing um, uh, in early adulthood. It continues to change throughout your lifetime. In fact, you probably change it. Uh, your, you probably get mostly new skeleton every seven years or so. Um, so, Let's start at the beginning. When does this bone formation start? It begins at around week eight of embryological development, so fairly early on. Um, and most bone uh, forms by replacing haline cartilage, which we talked about before. Um, yeah. So let's take a look. So here we got early embryo, um, mostly haline cartilage here, and then the bone starts to form and starts to replace the cartilage uh, slowly, a little at a time. Cartilage degrades, bone replaces it. More cartilage de decays, bone replaces it. Here, we got a couple more uh, locations of bone formation towards the epiphysi, as opposed to just the diaphysis of this long bone. Um, and here at the end, uh, you know, at birth, we can see we have pretty much solid bones in the diaphysis and the two epiphysi. Still cartilage here at the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. And this is where bone's going to grow because bone replaces cartilage. So a little new cartilage will grow in. Then that'll get replaced by bone, new cartilage, bone, new cartilage, bone, um, to lengthen the bones out as you grow. Um, and you can see right here, uh, this is why infants have more bones than adults. Adults have got about 206. Infants has got close to 300-something, right? Uh, unfortunately, I can't remember the exact number. I'll put it right here um, in the video. But you can see we got actually one, two, three uh, bones in there. All right, so um, how do we regulate bone growth during youth? Um, it's, it's a hormonal process because we're talking about long-term changes in the body, so it's not a nervous system control. It's hormonal control. And during infancy and childhood, uh, the epiphyseal plate activity, so growing more cartilage and then replacing some of that with bone, is stimulated by human growth hormone, HGH, as opposed to which you may have heard in the news like BGH, bovine growth hormone, which helps cows grow. Um, during puberty um, in adolescence, um, we kind of take over with testosterone as estrogen as we start developing our secondary sexual characteristics that uh, help differentiate us during puberty uh, between the different uh, biological genders. Um, not uh, what you feel, but what your body does. Um, and so initially, uh, that will promote adolescent growth spurts as those levels start to rise. But eventually, as those levels continue to change, they'll induce the end of epiphyseal growth, and you'll have plate closure, uh, which means your bones will no longer grow longer. You won't get any taller at that point. Now, they can still widen out or skinny up, depending on the stresses you put on them later in life, but you're done growing at that point. And that's why um, some of you may have had to have x-rays on your limbs for various reasons in recent years, and your doctor may have told you, oh, you're still growing, or no, you're not. You're done growing. Um, and that would be because they're looking at that growth plate. Um, and if it has, if it's still cartilage, um, you're either right at the end of your growth or you're still growing. And if it's bone and no cartilage anymore, you're done growing. Um, now, where do we deposit bone um, after growth? Um, we deposit it where the bone is either injured, obviously for healing, or where we need extra strength, which is interesting. It produces a lot of interesting things we can study in the bones. In order to do this, you need a diet rich in protein, vitamins, C, D, A, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, uh, manganese, all these different little things that are part of that bony matrix. Um, but two real key things um, are calcium and vitamin D. Calcium, obviously, is a large chunk of your bones. Over half your bone is calcium. Um, and vitamin D is needed for your body to process the calcium. That's why anybody who's on calcium supplements, um, usually they're taking calcium and vitamin D, or they get a supplement that has them both. Because if you just take a lot of calcium, but you don't have enough vitamin D, you're not going to be able to absorb it all. It's just going to go right through you. 
All right. So that's bone deposition. How about bone reabsorption? So pulling the uh, calcium and stuff out of the bone to put it into your blood when your calcium levels get too low in your blood. So in reabsorption involves osteoclasts secreting a lysosomal enzyme, which we talked about in the last unit, or last unit, the uh, last set of notes, um, and acids, which will dissolve that bone and secrete it into the extracellular fluid, which it gets into your blood and raises your calcium levels. So how do we control this remodeling of laying down bone sometimes and taking out bone at other times? Um, there's two primary control loops, okay? Uh, negative feedback loops, basically. The primary, the, the ultimate, the one that has uh, superiority control first go at whether it puts bone in or takes bone out of your bone. The primary one is the hormonal mechanism that maintains calcium homeostasis in the blood. Um, keeping the right levels of calcium in your blood, like we've mentioned a couple of times so far in the notes, is extremely important for your life. With well, proper levels of calcium, uh, no muscle contraction, and no nerve firing, which means no life. Okay, so we need to keep that relatively constant pretty much every minute of the day. So that takes primary um, uh, place, okay, in the order here. Now, if you have enough calcium, the secondary mechanism on where you deposit bone is where you have mechanical and gravitational forces putting stress on the bones. That'll determine what areas get more calcium and which areas get less calcium. Let's take a look at the primary mechanism or hormonal mechanism first. Uh, this is just a double feedback loop like we've talked about before. Um, if you have rising blood calcium levels, so you have more calcium in your blood than you really need to, to maintain muscle and nerve functions, um, that's going to trigger your thyroid to release calcitonin, a hormone. Calcitonin uh, literally puts calcium into your bones. So that'll cause your uh, osteoblasts to take calcium out of the blood and use it to build more bony matrix, making your bones stronger and storing more calcium for later when you might need it. Now, if your calcium uh, levels are falling in the blood, that's going to get your parathyroid gland to secrete parathyroid hormone, or PTH. Um, and that's going to cause the osteoclasts to dissolve the bony matrix and put that calcium back into the blood. So it brings your calcium levels back up. Okay, It's a simple double negative feedback loop like we've talked about before. Um, and its main goal is to maintain blood calcium levels at the appropriate level. Okay, And this is why if you want to have strong bones, especially as you get older, you want to maintain, try to keep that, you want to try to keep that balance. You know, if it's not perfectly balanced, keep it on this end of it. So your rising blood calcium levels will force more into your bones. It'll cause your bones to um, add calcium as opposed to lose calcium. If you're not getting enough calcium on a regular basis, you kind of tip the balance in this direction a little too often, your bones are going to get more porous and weaker, okay? Because your body's more concerned about muscle and nerve function than it is about strong bones, okay? Strong, weak bones, that might harm you eventually or kill you eventually, um, but nerves not firing and muscles not firing, that's going to kill you quick. So try to keep your blood balance up on this end, a little extra calcium if you can, as opposed to not quite enough calcium. Now, the secondary mechanism for where we deposit bone um, is known as Wolf's Law. And it states that a bone grows or remodels in response to the forces or demands placed upon it, which makes sense. We see this all over the body um, when uh, it's got in, injured or damaged or you put it under stress, it will build back or try to build back stronger than it was before. Scar tissue, more collagen, tougher skin right there. Um, weightlifting right? You stress those muscles and they say, heck, we're not strong enough. We better put more myosin and actin into those muscle fibers to make it stronger. And that's how, you know, building muscle works with weightlifting and things. Um, with bone, it works the same way. If you stress the bone, it's going in certain areas, it's going to grow thicker and stronger in those areas. Or if you don't stress the bones, um, it's not going to grow thicker and stronger. Okay. Um, we see observations of this. Long bones are thickest in the middle, right here, where they're most likely to buckle under stress. 
Uh, curved bones are thickest where they're most likely to buckle as well. And large bony projections, like you can see on this one right here, right? Big bony projections. Um, those uh, occur where you have a lot of uh, muscle pulling on the bones. Um, so we can see different things about how people uh, lived um, and what kind of jobs they did by looking at their bones. Anthropologists, if you watch shows on archaeology and anthropology, can dig up a skeleton and tell you quite a lot about what that person probably did during their lifetime, right? Um, if they've got big uh, muscle attachments, like right here on the shoulder blades or things like that, that means there was a big muscle attached there. So that... There's a big muscle, was applying a lot of stress to the bones. The bone grew larger in response. So if you look like a big bodybuilder like The Rock or Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, skeleton, their bones are going to be much thicker because they've been under a lot more stress with pumping all that iron, right? And the projections, the parts that kind of stick out to give the bones more surface area to attach to, are also going to be larger and thicker because they had to put up with all that extra stress from all that uh, weights that they're lifting all the time. You can tell if somebody was doing delicate work, if they work in the fields, if they're bending over a lot, um, if they're swinging a hammer all their lives. Those kind of things will change your, the shape of your skeleton over a lifetime because of Wolf's Law. Okay? We also see this in astronauts. I don't know if you've ever seen a video of them up on the space station. You'll also see them uh, strapped down to a um, treadmill. with bungee cords. So when they're trying to run, but the bungee cords are pulling them into the treadmill and that causes more stress on their bones because rather than just barely touching down on the treadmill, they slam into a little bit more as they go. And that adds stress, which triggers bone deposition, right? They keep a diet high in calcium and they stress the bones to try to force the bones to stay thicker and stronger because up in space, you don't have the normal gravitational pulls um, and stress is acting on your bones like we normally do. So the bones will get weaker over time unless you stress them. So a big part of their routine up there is to try to maintain muscle and bone strength. So when they do come back to gravity, uh, they're not too weak to survive. Um, here we can just see some of the stresses on a bone. Uh, this might be a good diagram to look at when we do our bioengineering on a bone later. Uh, but we can see here we got a femur. Lots of stress coming right down here. So here on this side of the bone, here's kind of the pivot point where the bone wants to snap over, right? We got the stress hip here on the top, so it's pushing down here. So we got a stress point right here where it wants to pivot and break. So it's going to be pretty strong right here. Lots of internal support, lots of uh, spongy bone in there. And it's compression forces over here. And those compression forces get stronger the farther out you go, kind of like a lever, right? I can push down here a little bit, but if I push down over here, I get even more leverage on my thumb. Right. And on the other side, on the other side, we have tension forces, pulling forces. It's trying to push the bone down over here, but it's trying to pull the bone on the other side. And those stresses get stronger as it goes out as well, which is why you see compact bone on the outside in this area. So those are things to keep about. Uh, keep in mind when you're designing your bone, what areas are under compression, what areas are under tension, and how much... Um, tension and compression in different areas will allow you to design, put the maximum amount of material and strength of the right type in the areas of your bone that are going to have the most stress and the least amount of material and uh, resources in the areas that are going to have the least stress. And that ends our section on uh, bone growth and development. Um, the next part, we'll take a look at different types of bone fractures briefly. Um, uh, different conditions like osteoporosis and how we heal bones, which has a lot to do with bone remodeling, but we'll look specifically at the stages and healing. So I hope to see you guys next time. Have a wonderful day.